Okay, welcome everybody to our third symposium in the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the Medical Scholars Program. The, this symposium will entitled Building Excellence in the Continuum of Medical Education will discuss the evolving core values, curriculum themes, and strategies that uh, are evolving in the continuum of medical education. In a letter to Robert Hooke in 1675, Isaac Newton said that if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And in fact, today, as in the last two uh, previous two symposium, we have a group of giants. And to start off uh, this group of giants, I'd like to introduce our Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs and Professor of Emergency Medicine, Dr. Robert Barish. Dr. Barish uh, came to us from um, uh, a series of uh, uh, both academic and, and administrative roles uh, as, as an emergency uh, physician who, who played a large part in delivering care during Katrina. And uh, for 25 years or, or, or more, he was uh, a faculty member, uh, department head uh, at the University of Maryland. And I was fortunate enough to serve on the search committee that identified Dr. Barish. Dr. Barish, when he was at the University of, of Maryland, um, was uh, mentored by uh, Dr. Don Wilson, who spoke, who spoke at our last symposium. And I, when I spoke to Dr. Wilson as part of the recruitment or due diligence for Dr. Barish, Dr. Wilson made two, two wonderful comments. The first comment he made was, you know, you couldn't go wrong by recruiting Dr. Barish. And then he thought by a, for a moment, and he said, you could only go right by recruiting Dr. Barish. So you, you scan the uh, Scylla and Charybdis of right and wrong. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Barish, our Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs. Uh, thank you, no, I'm Dr. Chambers, for those kind comments. And uh, welcome and good evening. It's my pleasure to join in this symposium celebration about building excellence in the medical education continuum. In fact, the University of Illinois College of Medicine has a rich legacy of excellence goes back to the first chapter of the prestigious Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society that was founded right here on our campus in 1908. This tradition also carries into our modern era with such prestigious alumni as David Sackett, who is regarded as the father of evidence-based medicine and influential physicians, including a former US Surgeon General, Dr. Julius Richmond, and the first female head of a department of surgery, Dr. Olga Jonasson. And Don, thank you for uh, mentioning uh, Dr. Donald Wilson, my mentor for 12 years at the University of Maryland, who was the first African-American Dean at the University of Maryland, and then uh, went on to be the chairman of the councils of, of all the deans in the United States. So although we uh, celebrate 25 years of the GPPA program, we also recognize the continued prominence of the College of Medicine as a significant national leader in the education and continued training of the future leaders in health and medicine. In addition to our notable alumni, the College of Medicine is recognized today for graduating the most amount of Hispanic physicians in the nation and the third most African-American physicians behind only Howard and Meharry. With these accolades in mind, it's evident that the College of Medicine continues to be a national powerhouse in medical education. We truly have much to be proud of. Clearly, medical education is something we take very seriously here at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. And although the profound dedication of such leaders as Dr. Chambers and Dr. Curry, the College of Medicine is galvanizing thought leaders such as those on the panel today and on other recent panels to provide insight and context to the next evolution of medical training and education. As leaders, we're committed to lifelong learning as the profession requires us to be open to new science, groundbreaking discoveries, and of course, to adapt to new realities. Something we have certainly all learned of in the past two years. So further as academic physicians, we've taken upon ourselves to share our knowledge 
and to advance the profession for future generations. Often in science and medicine, we say, as you said, Don, you stole my line, we stand on the, the shoulders of giants. And the goals of the GPPA program and this symposium is to do just that. I look forward to this presentation and conversations today as I'm certain it will showcase important perspectives and insights to benefit all of our learners and for generations to come. So Don, thank you. And I really look forward to the symposium. Thanks, Bob. Going back to data though, I would argue that I stole Newton's line. So, <laughs> so it's a, it is a continuum of, of uh, important understandings, if you will. Our first speaker in today's symposium will be uh, Dr. Raymond Curry, who is our Senior Associate Dean for Educational Affairs and Professor of Medicine and Medical Education of the University of Illinois College of Medicine. Dr. Curry has had a long, distinguished career. He was uh, trained at, at Washington University Medical School and then arrived at Northwestern, where until very recently, he was Dean of Medical Education. He is clearly a uh, national spokesperson for medical education. He has been a wonderful mentor and colleague for me, and he is going to set the stage by talking about the new humanities and the new science. Ray, thank you. Thank you very much, Don. I'm really delighted to be here as part of the celebration of the silver anniversary of the GPPA program, an honor that Dr. Chambers has asked me to lead off for this panel of very distinguished guest speakers. My goal is to lay a, a common foundation, albeit it will need to be a little superficial, um, for their presentations and for the discussion that will follow. Dr. Dean Sag was a key player in one of the most influential developments in medical school curricula over the past 50 years, the new pathway at Harvard, and in its evolution since then, and has also written about new approaches to pre-medical education. Dr. Perlman, the physician and evolutionary biologist, has long been interested in and written and writing about the role of the sciences in medical education. And Dr. Sharon is well recognized as the prime mover in advancing narrative approaches to our understanding of medicine and incorporating narrative methods into medical education. She will be approaching our topic today from the perspective of the humanities and their role in medical education. First off, for this declaration that I have no conflicts of interest here, um, I do sit on the liaison committee of medical liaison committee on medical education. But what I'm presenting here is my own opinion and does not represent any policy directions that LCME uh, might be considering. I'm going to start um, by trying to provide a broad historical basis for what our guest speakers to follow may bring to us. And we'll start with the two cultures argument of C.P. Snow. Snow first writing about this in 1959 described two polar, whoops, two polar groups. Um, at one pole, we have the literary intellectuals at the other scientists and as the most representative physical scientists, between the two, a gulf of mutual incomprehension. Now, as you might imagine, Snow's argument has been, been critiqued through the years, and uh, thanks to the emergence of the social sciences and effective qualitative methods is demonstrably not necessarily the black and white circumstance presented here, but it's a good starting point for our discussion. In medicine, we have our own go-to guy on this, William Osler, of course, and he anticipated Snow's argument to some extent by more than three decades. In 1919, when inducted as president of the British Classical Association, he entitled his address, The Old Humanities and the New Science. Now in addressing the new science and focusing his remarks on his own profession of medicine, uh, when speaking to all the classicists, he was in fact doing what you might expect. This was just a few years after the Flexner Report had emphasized the importance of medical schools being part of universities and advocating a focus on what Flexner called the laboratory sciences. In doing so, Flexner was promoting the model created at Johns Hopkins in the 1890s with Osler, of course, as one of the main players. By the time Osler was giving his address, 
The Rockefeller Foundation had invested in several other medical schools, Vanderbilt, Washington University, University of Michigan, and others that were adopting the Hopkins model. But what did he mean by the humanities? For Osler, the humanities were the classics. His list of the 10 most essential books for the, quote, liberal education of a medical student included Plutarch, Marcus Aurelius, an anchor of his own library, Sir Thomas Brown's Religio Medici. For some time, knowledge of Greek and Latin were the mark of an educated man. Pardon the gender, uh, genderness of the presentation, that's the way it was. And for Osler, very much conscious of the days when a college education was not required for entry to medical school, the pre-medical education he promoted was synonymous with being educated in the classics. There is within the book, this cute little piece of doggerel, uh, not authored by him, he stole it. Um, and it's worth reading because it's a lot more fun to read than just to, to, to hear than just to read. Botany re relies on Latin ever since Linnaeus days. Biologic nomenclature draws on Greek in countless ways. While in medicine, it's obvious, you can never take your oath what an ailment means exactly if you haven't studied both. So Osler then notes the relevance of this focus on the classics to the study of sciences, not necessarily the new sciences he's talking about, but at least going as far as the enlightenment. The scientific students should go to the sources and in some ways be taught the connection of Democritus with Dalton, et cetera, et cetera, as you see here, and Plato and Aristotle with them all. Now I have to pause here and point out one of the problematic consequences of this focus on Greek and Latin, or simply the movement toward requiring a college degree for entrance to medical school at a time when most college students did study Greek and Latin on the demographics of the medical profession in America. Not that I would, would advocate you know, admitting people to medical school without a college degree. Um, maybe to GPPA, but not to medical school. So Osler's vision for a more exclusive profession left little room for what we now call diversity and inclusion. We see this also with the Flexner Report, which resulted in the closure of most of the medical colleges attended by black students and female students. But this too is more nuanced uh, than you, you might imagine at first hearing. So more on Flexner's legacy later. But let's go back to the changes that were then underway in medical education. The conventional story is that following the Flexner report, the focus on medicine as applied science became increasingly dominant. And along with the resulting prolifer proliferation of medical specialization, we lost the personal touch of the community practitioner and lost track of the humanity of the patient. And only then during the next era of progressivism in the 1960s, 1970s, with the first stirrings of patient advocacy, the, emergency, the emergence of the biopsychosocial model and the specialty of family medicine did things begin to rebalance. So goes the story. And medical educators by this account have been fighting with the biomedical establishment ever since to effectively reform medical education. It's much more nuanced though, and much more interesting than that. I'll spend the rest of my time here in a brief overview of how medical curricula gained breadth beyond the biomedical sciences and traditional clinical skills through the last century, focusing on what for lack of a single descriptive term we'll call the humanities, and then briefly do the, various, uh, uh, do the same thing for the sciences. First, going back to Flexner for a moment, um, despite what is, what has been said recently uh, in, in um, terms of what I just mentioned about the closure of many medical schools um, that, that, uh, that were affected by the changes he'd made. And despite the assertion that Flexnerian medicine is uh, exclusively concerned with the sciences of medicine, and Flexner was writing his next book, or one of his next books, which was a comparative study of medicine in, the, in uh, uh, Europe and the United States. He was talking about how, in fact, scientific medicine in America is sadly deficient in cultural and philosophic background. Um, Flexner, too, to elaborate on more on what I said earlier about the Hopkins model and the Flexner report, um, 
later realized also the attention need for attention to healthcare availability and equity and, and quality and partnered with, with Julius Rosenwald, the Chicago businessman and philanthropist who led Sears Roebuck and others to try and create new pathways for black physicians in the 1920s. Another died in the wool scientist, LJ Henderson, best known for the henderson hasselbach equation that we all learn in the study of acid-based chemistry, was also an early proponent of teaching communication skills to medical students. 1920s. And of course, we have Francis Peabody, whose 1926 commencement address to Harvard students urged us to recognize that the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. In fact, Peabody would be a good reference point for this entire discussion. For as Howard Brody has pointed out, this essay, commonly held to be all about the humanistic physician, is every bit as much about the nature of medical science. Then there's Milton Winternitz, the Dean of Yale Medical School in the 1920s and 30s, who established an Institute for Human Relations involving the university's social scientists in the study of patients as whole people. The effort failed, but you can still see the name of the Institute inscribed on the Sterling Hall of Medicine at Yale. It's pretty faint, but if you can see my cursor, there it is. So th that's just a glimpse at a few of the people, a few of the leaders um, that were in fact thinking uh, very broadly throughout the early 20th century. Um, let's take a closer look now at what I'm gonna call the new humanities as opposed to Osler's old humanities as they became incorporated into medical education and medicine through the decades. Here's a schematic that's meant to, to illustrate some of the high points. Um, not at all to scale, there's no calendar across the bottom or anything that would be too difficult uh, and by no means exhaustive. But I, I'm trying here to point out the progressive introductions of new aspects of medicine and medical education through the 20th century and up to the present. Bear in mind, for example, that psychiatry brought an early emphasis on interpersonal and intrapersonal dynamics into the medical sphere in the early 20th century. In the latter half of the century, George Ingle and others began to integrate the psychosocial perspectives into mainstream medicine. Biomedical ethics emerged out of the Nuremberg trials and evolved into an ethics of clinical research. Uh, and Rita Sharon and others introduced a reflective humanities-based perspective. Then most recently, we have recognized with more urgency than before, the importance of addressing issues of health equity and racism within society, within the profession itself not represented in the graphic here, and then was still meant to be that graphic, but also very relevant are changes within the demographics of the profession. There's no question in my mind that the dramatic increase in women entering the profession has facilitated the shift to a more, hol more holistic vision of our mission. The parallel need to ensure that access to the profession reflects the socioeconomic and racial composition of our society is also very, very, relevant here. So those are the new humanities. What are the sciences? This evolution is perhaps even more complex and also much better known to you. So I'll be brief um, and, and admittedly superficial. Following steady progress in our understanding of biochemistry, physiology, microbiology, and immunology during the first half of the 20th century, the Big Bang creating entirely new disciplines at the molecular and genetic level occurred in 1953 with the discovery of the structure of DNA. You could place any number of subsequent developments in related fields along the map as well. But I've limited myself here just to the completion of the Human Genome Project, uh, given that it, along with the development of digital data resources in the preceding few decades, has brought us into the era of big data in medicine. And more recently, the tools we have to chew on big data are bringing precision medicine and artificial intelligence into the physician's world. Dr. Perlman will be elaborating on this later, I believe. Without diving further into other areas, my point is to highlight a fact that has been discussed and written about extensively, that the very nature of the physician's relationship to the sciences has changed dramatically over the last two decades or so. We must now be as attentive to information sciences as we have been to the biomedical sciences and the latter are themselves increasingly dependent upon the former. 
And there um, have indeed been changes, large and small, in medical education, that is. I tend to see the inflection point in modern medical education as the 1986 or 1984, I believe, WMC report on the general professional education of the physician, the GPEP report. Several major initiatives to reform medical education dating back to the 1930s had relatively little influence, but the GPEP report did stimulate meaningful change. Dr. Deanstag will no doubt take us back to that era in his comments. Even then, though the movement toward a more integrated and holistic model for medication was evident th throughout there. Here's uh, Charles Odegaard, who was the president of the University of Washington, um, responding to the GPEP report. One cannot escape the conclusion that in this report, and he meant GPEP, the flexnerian form of medical education with this exclusive concentration on disease, again, perhaps true of the Flexner report, but not necessarily a Flexner uh, uh, throughout the rest of his writings, interpreted in the light of findings based upon the biological, chemical, and physical sciences was accepted without any need for comment. The panel in its report simply did not subject it to critical review. And Michael Whit, whoop, there I go again. And Michael Whitcomb, uh, who was then the editor of Academic Medicine, looking back upon that debate that Odegaard, and there were some responses to that, uh, put forth, noted in 2005 that the tension that existed between these two camps in the 1980s persists today. So yes, these tensions between the sciences and humanities do persist. Most medical educators um, would agree that both are critical components of a physician's education, but the tensions are there, both within the profession and maybe more importantly, uh, and more intransigently uh, within our society more generally. Uh, in education, there's an intense focus on education in the STEM fields and articles about the challenges facing humanities departments and faculty are regularly appearing in the Chronicle of Higher Education. This, this isn't exactly new, it's just persistent. Here we have uh, Ronald Reagan uh, as governor of California in 1965 uh, in the midst of his fight with Clark Kerr, the um, president of the University of California system. The state should not subsidize intellectual curiosity. And more recently, uh, Governor Scott, Florida, saying something very similar. I'm not going to take money from a citizen to put education, uh, I'm sorry, if I'm going to take money from a citizen to put in education, I'm gonna create jobs. Is it a vital interest of the state to have more anthropologists? I don't think so. And within medical education, we have Sir David Weatherall, one of Osler's successors as the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford, uh, sounding this cautionary note, 100th anniversary of the Flexner Report is an appropriate time to discuss whether well-intentioned efforts to humanize students' medical school experiences and to make students responsive to the needs of patients threaten the core value, namely competence in contemporary biomedical science. There have been, been changes, of course. I referred to some of them earlier. Um, you know, a couple of other um, things to mention, small things to mention, but significant. The new MCAT, as of, I think, 2015, now includes a social science segment, leading pre-medical students across the country to incorporate the social sciences into their college experience. And many medical schools now include a social science prerequisite because of that as well. Pre-medical calculus requirements are giving way to suggested or required statistics courses. And we have a number of active curricular initiatives and publications guiding the further development of both the new humanities and the new sciences. In 2009, the Howard Hughes Institute collaborated with the WMC um, to produce a guidance document for scientific education and medicine. Dr. Dean Stagg, I should note, was a member of the group that produced this report. Then the WMC has more recently published, this is 2020, 
a scoping review of publications in the humanities as they relate to the health professions as part of an initiative called FRAME. Both of these documents include discussion of new opportunities across the entire educational continuum from pre-medical college preparation to postgraduate training. And of course, I would be remiss in this context uh, if uh, in mentioning the pre-medical experience, uh, I did not bring in the role that combined BAMD programs can play in attending to these changes. The GPA program here has a well-organized four course sequence of courses, introducing all our first and second year college students to the role of physician in the profession's culture and history. The Brown University program in liberal, med liberal medical education, and I would note the, uh, the use of the reference to liberal education again, uh, does offer several unique electives to its students, in addition to encouraging majors in a broad variety of disciplines and tailoring selected offerings in the sciences to the pre-medical perspective. And in addition to these formal combined programs, students at an increasing number of colleges and universities can major or minor in the health humanities. There are clear opportunities here for further incorporation of the new humanities and the new sciences relevant to medicine along the continuum. One interesting finding from that frame scoping review is the distribution of publications they found relevant to their criteria that they were looking at for the scoping review across the medical education continuum. Only 5% of the publications in that scoping review related to the introduction of medically related humanities topics at the college level. So kudos to Dr. Chambers and the GPPA faculty for having attending, attended to these needs over the past 25 years. Just a brief look at the program's mission statement to recenter us on the reason that we're all here and to note the congruence of the program's mission with much of what I've been saying. I'll close with a quote that's become one of my favorites whenever I'm daunted by all the challenges that we face um, as medical educators. This is from Hilliard Jason, who uh, was at the time at Michigan State um, in the Office of Medical Education Research and Development there, uh, now at the University of Colorado. Of all the works of man, few can be more complex or potentially more important to society than the task of creating physicians. With that, um, hoping that I've done what I promised, which is to lay just a general groundwork um, for each of the three talks that follows, I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Chambers and look forward to hearing from our invited guest speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. You've given us so much food for thought that uh, for the moment, we, we are forced to go on a limited diet because I think we could go on and on and on just with a discussion of the wonderful things you have, uh, you have mentioned. But we need to go on. And in so doing, I need to introduce our next speaker Dr. Jules Deanstag, Dr. In, in assessing um, academic physicians uh, for things like promotion and tenure, we often talk about addressing the three stools of academic medicine, clinical service, uh, education, medical education, and medical research. In, in his life as an academic physician, Dr. Deanstag has addressed all three of those in imaginative, creative ways, and we are all so much the better for it. Dr. Deanstag um, is a product of uh, Columbia College and its, its core curriculum. He then uh, did his medical degree at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia, then went to, after time, went to the NIH and became an expert in viral diseases of the liver. And after his time at NIH, went 
to do a fellowship in gastroenterology with a, a supreme giant, uh, Kurt Isselbacher at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And Dr. Dean Stagg has essentially never left the, M the MGH since that time. But along the way, he also became very interested in medical education and the progress of medical education at Harvard. And when Dan Tosterson um, proposed or dictated that Harvard would adopt a new pathway, essentially, as I see things, Dr. Deanstag became one of the major facilitators of that journey. And he is going to talk to us today about the evolution of the curriculum at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, I am so pleased that Dr. Dean Stagg agreed to be with us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Don, for that um, overly generous uh, introduction. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this fascinating symposium. Um, I would mention that at Columbia College, I read great books of Western literature for all four years. I was, <laughs> but we'll get to that later, or <laughs> maybe later. So I'm going to, I'd like to just bring you along um, as our curriculum evolved. And I, I think you can say one thing about medical curricula is that if you've seen one, you've seen one. No two are exactly alike. We're all struggling with the same uh, objectives, but we all seem to do it in different ways. And I think that's a product of the fact that we have different students and we have different faculty. And each of us um, work with these two with, with these two constituencies in a very unique way. But um, I have no, no, um, <clears throat> no disclosures, and this is what I'd like to do today. I'd, I'd just like to bring you along on a journey and, and convey to you the continuum of change in a representative medical curriculum. It doesn't mean that we're doing it the right way or the only way. This is just one way that we're doing it. And all our peers at all our sister schools are doing pretty much the same thing, but in different ways. I'll start with the effort um, that we focused on early in the 2000s to, to um, revise the pre-medical curriculum and make it much more relevant and much more rigorous. And then take you through a couple of aspects of our curriculum in the mid 2000, 2006, where we introduced a year-long clinical clerkship integrated uh, program called the, uh, excuse me, the Principal Clinical Experience, which I'll get to. And that's when we introduced a requirement for a scholarly project, um, pretty much to make medical education a little bit much, a little bit more like graduate medical, like graduate education. And then bring you a decade later to our new path, our new <laughs> curriculum, which instead of being called the new pathway is called Pathways. But the idea is to reimagine pre-clerkship educa pre education in a curriculum that integrates science and clinical medicine over all four years. We've changed our pedagogy from problem-based learning to something that we call case-based collaborative learning, which I'll explain. And we introduce a return to the basic and population sciences in the uh, post-clerkship curriculum uh, with these very interesting courses called advanced integrated science courses, which are tailored to uh, customize each individual student's pathway. So let's start with uh, medical education or pre-medical education. We were just about to launch a revision of the new pathways program, which I'll get to a little bit later. And we said to ourselves, um, does pre-medical education prepare students adequately for what we are planning in our new curriculum? And essentially what we ended up calling for was um, an increase in the relevance of pre-medical education and the rigor of pre-medical education to prepare students better for what we were hoping to teach them in medical school. And here is the reality at the time. Uh, scientific knowledge has, was changing dramatically. There were more sophisticated, entirely new disciplines being introduced. Genomics, informatics, revolutionizing biomedical science and healthcare. There were parallel changes in medical practice and healthcare delivery. And despite these sweeping changes and the permeation of medicine by molecular, cellular biology, and genetics, 
medical school admissions requirements hadn't really changed for many decades. Um, I'll admit that a, cent a half a century ago when I was in, in college, the biology requirements for medical school were a, were a semester of botany and a semester of zoology, if you can believe it. Um, it wasn't quite that bad in 2006, but it wasn't really much better. In fact, high school students were learning advanced science and mathematics that used to be taught in college or medical school. I was amazed that my, my sons were learning what I learned in both in college and medical school for the first time, and they were learning it in, in high school. And what, the other problem was that you, American medical schools continued to have to devote precious pre-clerkship time to very elementary level biochemistry, cell biology, and genetics, which ideally students should have become prepared um, with already. So um, our conclusion was that the current level of pre-medical sciences, which as you remember, a year of biology, a year of chemistry, a year of organic chemistry, a year of physics, and at least at our school, a year of, of calculus, were uh, inadequately rigorous to prepare students for contemporary molecular medicine. We weren't advocating for more time in college devoted to pre-medical courses. We just, we, we felt very strongly that we needed to allow time for other academically challenging and scholarly pursuits. Instead, we were advocating for greater efficiency, a focus on science that matters to medicine and is relevant, and interdisciplinary content that breaks down, that breaks down silos among and demonstrates complementarity of biology, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. So when we looked at the specific disciplines, I'll go through this quickly, we felt biology should no longer be non-human biology, it should be human biology. And a lot of our courses, even at places like Harvard College and Columbia College, uh, were teaching, there was very little human biology in the entire one year curriculum. So we were advocating for the kinds of things that are required for understanding human biology. And I've listed a few of them here, signal transduction, pharmacologic principles, homeostasis, et cetera, et cetera. When it came to chemistry, uh, we thought that the notion of spending a year in organic chemistry, um, about half of it devoted to proteins to organic synthesis, wasn't really good preparation. What we really wanted to do is we wanted to get students prepared for biochemist biochemistry, and we advocated for a continuum that included chemistry, organic chemistry, primarily um, protein structure and function, less organic synthesis, and um, introductory biochemistry as a requirement so that in medical school, we could start at a higher level. And in terms of physics, that was pretty much, that wasn't changed very much because these uh, biologically relevant areas of physics were covered in most uh, pre-medical physics courses. In terms of calculus, Again, I mentioned that we were one of the last schools to retain calculus as a, as a requirement. And that was because our faculty felt that the mathematical description and uncertainties of dynamic biological systems were important concepts for people to understand and no better way to do that than in, in learning calculus. But there really wasn't any reason to do what I had to do for half a year and that is derive biologically irrelevant theorems. And as was mentioned by several of us so far, everybody needs a grounding in statistics because every paper everybody reads um, is statistically based and students needed to be somewhat sophisticated in that area. And then analytical, analytical, write, analytical and writing skills, effective communication skills, of course, that goes without saying. We also in, reinforce this notion that college years should not be designed primarily as a vestibule to professional school. It should be a time where students have the option and the, and the luxury of exploring and stretching academically and intellectually to engage create, creatively in an intellectually expansive liberal arts education, encompassing literature, language, the arts, humanities, and the social sciences. Essentially, we should expect that our students in college are preparing themselves for citizenship in our multicultural society. They need some understanding of human behavior, appreciate societal structure and function and achieve cultural awareness. 
And essentially, um, if you think about it, uh, this was in the mid, let's say around 2005, 2000, 2004 to 2005. The recommendations were pretty faithful to the Physicians for the 21st Century Report, which many of you have already referred to and were referred to in the October 14th Symposium, and essentially were adopted and amplified by the HHMI AAMC report um, that came out in 2009. And I would um, mention that this was quite pivotal and led to the change in MCATs that were described. There was a complementary HHMI AMC report on the social sciences, and I don't have time to cover that, um, but that also led to the way curricula are being revised and the MCAT is, and the way the MCAT is being uh, restructured, has been restructured. Now, everything I've said so far is pretty abstract. So I wanna give you something a little bit tangible. Um, while we were thinking about what should happen in pre-medical education, the people who were teaching pre-medical sciences at Harvard College got together, got a big grant, and tried to design a, a course that would do exactly what we had been advocating for. And I, by the way, on our uh, working group for pre-medical requirements, we had both medical school faculty and college faculty. But the, they came up with these sequences um, life Sciences 1A and 1B, and I'm going to describe 1A for you. The idea was to offer an introductory course that reflects current, important, exciting questions in life sciences, to present essential knowledge and habits of mind drawing, drawn from the life sciences, to adopt an integrative question-oriented teaching approach, to facilitate appreciation of interdisciplinary connections between fields, and to associate these connections with emerging directions of science, and to recognize and express the diversity of intellectual and methodological approaches of life sciences. So this is what they came up with, Life Sciences 1A, an integrated introduction to life sciences through, by integrating chemistry, molecular biology, and cell biology. And the course essentially asks, what are the fundamental features of living systems? What are the molecules that impart these features? How do the chemical properties explain their biological roles? And the, the, the anticipation was that the answers to these questions uh, would form the basis of an understanding of the molecules of life, the cell, disease, and medicines. Now, in contrast to traditional presentation of relevant, sci relevant scientific disciplines in separate courses, the above concepts were examined through an integrated presentation of chemistry, molecular biology, biochemistry, and cell biology and they were framed within three cases. One, how the cell is the fundamental unit of life, and then a discussion of the biology of HIV, and then a module on cancer, all making pre-medical education highly relevant to what uh, medicine would, would be for this group of students. And this, this course is designed not only for pre-medical students, but for anyone uh, preparing for the advanced study of biology. So module one, how do, we how do we constitute the living cell? What's the difference between a flask where you put all the C, H, O, N, um, and P um, and the cell? What, what's the difference? Uh, what does it mean to be alive? And I'm just gonna go through this quickly because I'm not gonna teach you these, this course, but I wanna give you a flavor for what it's like. The importance of biological membranes to living systems, understanding the complexity of the cell, we need to understand the basis of molecular structure, energy, and how it's stored as ATP, compartmentalization and organization, the essence of being alive, proteins, the workhorses of the cell, DNA and information storage. And they basically went through a very comprehensive um, inclusion of the relevant basic sciences that would fulfill a course in biology, in chemistry, in cell biology, molecular biology, and did it all together in a very palatable, uh, palatable way that students really enjoyed. When it came to using HIV, this is how we taught, this is how they teach the immune system and virology and pharmacology. And then again, I'm not gonna go into detail, but I want you to just taste the flavor of this. Um, and then cell signaling was the way that they approached cancer. Um, 
Cells rely on molecular mechanisms for sensing and responding to the environment. First, we need to learn about cell signaling in general and protein kinases, the enzymes that mediate these pathways, and then understand how signaling pathways are important in cancer. And from that, you get the story of chronic myelogenous leukemia. Remember, these are college, college students. So, um, and you teach them the difference between growth dependent, growth factor dependent proliferation, which is normal and regulated by kinases, and in CML, growth factor independent proliferation in which the kinases are always on. And essentially what happens is it's a chromosomal translocation in the Philadelphia chromosome that causes CML by creating a fusion protein that a misregulated, always active tyrosine kinase. It's always on. So that's where you come up with an anti-cancer agent uh, that blocks this kinase phosphorylation. And there's no richer way I can imagine to learn all these concepts. So again, I just wanted to uh, leave you with the flavor of that. I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna try to explain all this to you, obviously. Um, but we also concluded in, this, in, this con in considering this that there would be a potential societal dividend if college science education improved. And that was there might just have been a beneficial impact on the scientific illiteracy and anti-science attitudes prevalent in society at large. And this was written in 2004. And you can imagine how this has gotten so much worse today. Okay, so that's module one, pre-medical education. Now I'd like to take you to medical education. And from, the, from our perspective, um, Charles Elliott was the president of Harvard University um, back in the late 1800s. And in um, almost a century after our medical school had been founded, he wrote that the ignorance and general incompetency of the average graduate of American medical schools at the time when he receives his degree, which turns him loose upon the community, is something horrible to contemplate. And again, um, I have to apologize for the sexism here, but as, as Dr. Curry mentioned, they were only men in medicine at the time. So the way he transformed um, medical education, again, president of the university focusing on the medical school, he introduced admissions and stand, admissions standards and requirements. The medical school became part of an integral part of the university. Um, education was uh, focused on the financial basis of medicine and the importance of scientific advances to the understanding of health and disease. He modernized the methodology and approaches for teaching medicine with new basic science and clinical departments established for the first time. And essentially this was the four year two plus two degree program uh, that we attribute to Flexner. Um, to graduate, you actually had to pass exams. And um, these ideas were also being pioneered not only at our, at, at our institution, but at Michigan, Penn, they were fully expressed at Hopkins and they were amplified in the Flexner report. And I think so much has been said about Flexner, I don't have to elaborate. So here we are in the late, 18, late 1800s. And then I'm going to skip about five iterations of curricular form in the next hundred years and move to the new pathway, which was introduced in 1985. And the person who, whose name is associated with this is Dan Tosseson, shown here. Um, and the concept was that they would adopt problem-based learning anchored in small group tutorials. Now, Harvard Medical School didn't invent PBL. We stole it from Dalhousie. Uh, we're very good at stealing things. Um, but when we take something on and we do it, then it attracts a lot of attention. And whether we're right or whether we're wrong, we get copied. So it was very important for us to do the right thing. And, and I think in retrospect, it was the right thing to do to change from a lecture-based curriculum to a problem-based learning curriculum. But we still did have lectures. Um, we wanted to focus on adult learning, active engagement, lifelong, uh, lifelong skills of self-directed learning, all these, um, uh, these are now considered mother's milk, problem solving, teamwork, critical thinking, reading the literature. And the other major change was a central management of the curriculum. We took the control of the pre clerkship curriculum away from the basic science departments, which were trying to teach everyone how to be a little anatomist, a little biochemist, a little pharmacologist, and 
changed it. We, what we wanted students to learn about anatomy, pharmacology, and biochemistry to become doctors. Now, that um, we have gotten to a point that was 1985. I think there are very few schools that don't have some level of problem based learning nowadays. But I want to skip another decade, or not two decades, um, to early 2000, 2003, 2006, when we felt that um, we needed medical education needed to go well beyond the new pathway. Um, yes, we did a, we tried to integrate basic science and clinical medicine in the new pathway, but essentially once students entered the clinical years, that was it. They never looked back at basic science. Uh, we wanted to re-engage many disenchanted faculty. And what we really focused on was a new model for clinical education. The new pathway focused not at all on the new, on clinical education. And as I mentioned before, we wanted to include an in-depth scholarly experience. And I'm not going to go through everything we did, but I do want to focus on how we changed the clinical curriculum. At Harvard Medical School, we're very blessed. We have some of the best hospitals in the country. And we have students doing medicine in, at, let's say, Mass General, pediatrics at Children's Hospital, um, uh, surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital, OBGYN at Beth Israel Hospital. And they get really incredibly wonderful clerkships. But um, the learning environment of these otherwise wonderful clinical clerkships was declining. There was a shift going on, moving patient care to the outpatient setting. Snapshots were replacing full experiences of disease, uh, natural history. Whenever a patient came in, diagnosis was made, disposition was achieved, and the poor medical student didn't know what hit him or her um, and didn't really get a chance to see the evolution and denouement of disease. Instead, we had high acuity, rapid paced, quick turnover, disposition-oriented inpatient rotations that were less hospitable to nurturing and less nurturing to student learning. Students were marginalized on the healthcare team, and there was no longer time on rounds to focus on pathophysiology, the scientific underpinnings of clinical medicine. It just wasn't time. From the faculty's perspective, they, shift, they were being asked to shift from teaching and mentoring to service and disposition. And the senior faculty said, I'm not doing this, and they disengaged. And then our medical students were being deprived of our traditional role models. The clerkships were excellent, but they were fragmented. There was no longitudinal oversight, no focus on the student's um, professional development. And if a student faltered in curriculum in clerkship one at hospital one, he or she was sent off to the next hospital for the, with the next clerkship and nobody made any effort to try to, 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 try to um, correct any, any starting on the wrong foot. And of course, there was inadequate, inadequate attention to ethical, social, cultural, and professional uh, issues in healthcare. Um, so this is what we called it, the, the pr uh, principal clinical experience. And what we, what we did was we, we in, for most of our students, retained our traditional clerkships um, at our three main, our, at three, at, at our main teaching hospitals. And we retained an outpatient experience in our clerkships, which we call the primary care clerkship, usually in a, a primary care practice. And there was a lot of richness here, which we, re, which we retained, but then we added on an overlay. All of these were gonna be done in one hospital. So the students would get to know the faculty of medicine in medicine while they and see them again when they were on surgery. We also had a core interdisciplinary curriculum that spanned the entire year where students were brought together and the, instead of the conferences being medical conferences or surgical conferences or, radi or radiology conferences, they were multidisciplinary and you could everybody would participate and the the discussions would be that much more rich. And then there was mentoring and advising that spanned the year. So the faculty got to know the students very well and the assessment was longitudinal and progressive. So um, we actually had two flavors. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I just explained the way it was done at the, with the major teaching hospitals, retaining immersion clerkships. Um, but we also have Cambridge, um, Cambridge Hospital 
which was a small community hospital and 12 students every year went there, did not have immersion clerkships, but were assigned a cohort of continuity patients in each of these disciplines. And they would go to the clinics every day. They would go to a different clinic or to several different clinics. And if their patients were admitted, they would follow them. And um, we could spend an entire hour on that, but I won't. But simply to say that these models um, dramatic, changed dramatically the way we taught preclinical, the way we taught clinical medicine in what was then the third year. And the principles was that we relied on longitudinality with faculty and house staff, with patients. There was opportunities to see patients multiple times along the continuum, with a peer group of students, learning with a peer group of students, with the hospital, the students identified with the institution, had a sense of belonging and ownership. There was continuity and longitudinality of feedback. There was a year-long curriculum that was interdisciplinary and carefully planned. And there was longitudinality of idealism, of the reinforcement of idealism, of mentoring, interdisciplinary perspectives, integration of basic and clinical sciences, these interdisciplinary uh, conferences brought basic science scientists and population scientists into the, into the uh, uh, curriculum um, so that while students were learning clinical medicine, they were still being bombarded with uh, basic and population science. This was very patient-centered and we did studies showing that our patient, our students caring and sharing were preserved. And it was very student-centered because it gave us an opportunity to know a student holistically and remediate those who were struggling and reinforce those who were, um, who were thriving. Um, and that's been very successful. And I, I, I'm not even sure I can convey how wonderful, uh, how, how, um, how well it has, um, it, has, it has worked for us in the, over these last 10 years. I'll just mention also that the other thing we did at the time was required a faculty mentored in-depth scholarly experience, uh, which anchors students in some area tailored to their individual needs that gives them scholarly ownership. Um, faculty mentors become their heroes and part of their lives and you end up with an extended partnership with a faculty mentor. And we're not trying to create laboratory investigators. We're trying to model the inquisitive physician, spark curiosity, embed the discipline of inquiry as a continuous and seamless part of medical education and practice, give them an experience in how to address unanswered questions and problems. We wanted graduates capable of deep reflections who reflection who were change agents and who had were given the opportunity to enlist and harness the energies of others towards a common goal. And just to show you the kinds of scholarship that we considered anything from basic biological, clinical translational population, healthcare policy, medical humanities, ethics, anthropology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that is now a graduation requirement and it works pretty well. So now to module three. That was a decade before, and then you get to this, the next decade, which was last decade, um, we decided that we needed to revise the curriculum again. We're very um, intellectually uh, restless, let's put it that way. Um, we realized that when we revised the education in 2003, 2006, we really didn't spend much time on the pre-clerkship curriculum. We basically tweaked it a little here or there. And in the interim, we'd had uh, task forces on classroom learning and uh, began to engage with better ways to teach and learn. We also had to address the mismatch between teachers and learners. There was a generational change in the way students engage and learn. Um, and our older faculty weren't resonating with our younger um, students who, who came up in the digital age. There was a lot of novel pedagogy being, uh, being introduced. There was what I would call curricular foment. Our peer schools were doing this. The new medical schools that were being brought on didn't have to undo anything. So they, they were very innovative and creative in the way they designed their curricula. And Harvard got a big grant of, uh, for the Harvard um, uh, Initiative on Learning, oops, for the Harvard Initiative on Learning and, and Teaching, which, mean, which meant there was money available for us uh, to actually work on new, new um, pedagogy. And we just felt that this was the time to review what, when, how, who, where uh, we teach. And I'll show you a little bit of what we did. So first of all, when it came to classroom learning and teaching, um, 
we felt that basically the lecture was dead. The lecture was very, and, and, and I have to bring us back, when we, when we had people lecturing, we had celebrity, celebrity uh, physician scientists lecturing, and a person might lecture on one day on his or her area of expertise and not know what went the day before or what was coming the next day. There was no integration of that sort. And in, a, um, in that kind of learning environment, the learning is at a surface level, it's fragmented, it's disorganized, it's not linked to previous knowledge, it's not reflective, it's based on memorization. We wanted to move more towards deep learning, which was integrated, coherent from one topic to the next, linked to previous knowledge, reflective, relevant to everyday experience, focusing primarily on using what you learn for problem solving and analysis. The classrooms we felt should be exclusively for interactive reasoning, never for conveying uh, knowledge passively. This is the flipped classroom method. Um, and we also moved from content experts, the celebrity lecturers, to uh, pedagogy experts. And we trained a new cadre, cadre, uh, cadre of core faculty who would teach for an entire um, segment and students would get to know them very well. Um, one of the problems with having celebrity uh, uh, world-renowned scientists teaching students um, who are just last year college students is the curse of knowledge. Some of our faculty knew their topic so well, they couldn't portray, they couldn't convey it in a way um, that um, people who didn't know as much about them could understand. And we found that a lot of our faculty were speaking at our students and our students weren't getting it. Um, so we divided the class into four 40 student learning groups and, um, and I'll explain to you why we moved from problem-based problem -based tutorials and how we got to this new methodology. So again, when, when we did problem-based learning in the 1980s, by the way, I wasn't involved at the time, so I take no credit for nurturing the, uh, the the new pathways for the first 20 years. I came into it a little bit later. But anyway, when, when we looked at the new tutorial, when we looked at tutorials that were really innovative in the 80s, we realized that when well, you know students aren't coming prepared, tutorial leaders each adapt tutorials independently and idiosyncratically. Some tutors were launching into many lectures, others were just sitting back passively and not involved at all. Students were wandering inefficiently down, down blind alleys. Some students dominated, other students just hid, and the tutorials really weren't evolving to become incrementally more challenging over time. So there was a lot, a lot that, uh, a lot that was wrong. So we came up with this new method based on the flipped classroom, and we called it case-based collaborative learning, CBCL. And the concept was that before students come to class, they would study on their own. We gave them concept videos, we gave them reading assignments, we gave them problem lists. Then they would come in the morning uh, to their, to their uh, learning studio, we'll call it. And first there was a readiness assessment, which is pretty much a part of team-based learning. Then students in groups of four would tackle focused open-ended questions. And there were 10 groups per classroom with two core faculty that they were with for the full course, not a new student, not a new faculty member every day. And then there would be a, a revelation and group discussion as each of the 10 groups revealed how they had solved the problem or how they had addressed the problem. And then finally, there would be synthesis and reinforcement by the two faculty facilitators in partnership with the students. And this was better than the way we were doing it because learning was enhanced when students really did become prepared. You can't hide in a group of four. You can hide in a group of eight, but you can't hide in a group of four. Um, the discussion was on topics determined to be important by the faculty. There were fewer dead ends and blind alleys, so there was much more efficient. And the student learning in teams mimics what really happens on the ward. Need for information sharing, reasoning, listening, arriving at best solutions. And there were opportunities for students to have substantive longitudinal relationships with core faculty that they never had with the faculty before. And this gave this improved assessment and provided opportunities, better opportunities for remediating struggling students. So 
That is the pedagogy we adopted. And then we took a look at the way we had, our curriculum was mal-structured or mal-aligned. The way we used to do it in, in the, up to 2006 and actually up to 2012 was that we spent a year on normal biology and a year on abnormal biology. And also in the year, in the first year, we had students do their scholarly project in the summer before they really had seen much of medicine. It was poorly timed. And then in the second year, when we were doing abnormal biology, they took their, um, their board exams. And essentially from about here on, um, they stopped coming to class and they stopped preparing because they were studying for USMLE. So they were, this USMLE was hijacking them from actually focusing on their education. Then we did the third year, the clinical year, and then the fourth year, the sub-internships and advanced uh, electives. Um, and that was the old, the old structure. And what's wrong with this picture? Well, separating human, um, separating normal from abnormal was inefficient and duplicative and not, re not sufficiently reinforcing. There was a tension between what students really need to know, what we call core content, um, in order to be clinical clerks and the rich, exciting material we want to cover as advanced faculty. And that reflects the difference between being an advanced college student and a physician to be in terms of what resonates with learners. And they are very, very different. And we learn that lesson um, very well by listening to our students complain. The timing, as I said, of USMLE detracted from student uh, preparing. And the scholarly project was misaligned because it was, was assigned before they really had a chance to see much of medicine. And there was no chance for electives or tailoring of the curriculum until the year, until year four. So um, there were a lot of things wrong and we decided to change it this way. So year one was an introduction to the core content needed for core clerkships. We taught normal and abnormal together and we tried to make this more relevant to what they would need as clinical clerks, but not teach them everything they would need to know to be advanced practitioners, investigators and the like. They started the clerk, the, the principal clinical uh, experience, the clinical clerkship year in year two. And then they had years three and four for advanced scientific and clinical topics um, a return to pathophysiology, uh, return to basic courses in social and population science and medical humanities. That's when the scholarly project is much better time and that's when sub-internships would be done. And that's when both USMLE step one and, and step two would be done. Uh, we also modified the way that we taught our students by having the faculty work as teams. So instead of having anatomists teaching anatomy, and cell biologists teaching, teaching cell biology and immunologists teaching immunology. We did it in teams and we structured the year so that it would be weighted heavily towards anatomy and histology at the beginning. And then molecular and cellular biology and genetics would come in and then immunology and microbiology and pathology would come in. And there would be integrated sessions that brought the faculty from the different modules together uh, just for example, antibiotics would have been an integrated session between molecular gene, molecules, gene cells, immunology, microbiology, and pathology. We had a practice of medicine course every Wednesday was devoted to learning the skills of clinical medicine. Um, and that was time to be integrated with what they were learning in the basic and um, population sciences. So the faculty coordinated across courses. This contributed to learning that was integrated, coherent, linked to, and that reinforced previous knowledge. And this has been a wonderful um, advance, not only for the students, but for the faculty who were involved in teaching. So this is how we reorganized the curriculum and just to focus on what was accomplished. We, we felt that there were core basic and population sciences that you needed to be a clinical clerk but the richness of more advanced science was best suited, suited for students after they had had experience on the wards. Um, and, this, and, and if you think about it, a college student or a recent college graduate thinks one way and somebody who's been through a year of clinical clerkships can go to something like medical grand rounds and learn from it. Pre, first 
first month pre-clerkship students don't do that. It moved the uh, clinical year earlier, allowing for richer post-clinical year experience, which was more compelling, better structured, individualized, with a dedicated scholarships block, selective choices of advanced topic tailored to a student's interest and career path. And as I'll explain, these advanced integrated science courses. We pushed USMLE to year three, so it didn't distract from pre-clerkship curriculum in year one. And this was all considered developmentally more appropriate. You taught just in time what the student needed for what they were doing next. We also had an opportunity to integrate um, pre, to integrate introduction to clinical medicine type courses in um, primary care practices, which turned into a continuum that extended into the second year during their ambulatory segment or an ambulatory experience during the clerkships. So essentially we changed this from a culture of two plus two where there was no meeting um, to an integrated four-year curriculum where basic science and clinical medicine were peppered throughout all four years. And I just wanted to show you, this is what the curriculum looks like. I'm not gonna go through this, but I wanna emphasize that um, the practice of medicine, as I mentioned, is a module that extends throughout the first year and actually is part of the second year as well. But social and population sciences are taught in the middle of the first year, health policy, ethics, social medicine, clinical epidemiology, population health. They're reinforced in the interdisciplinary con uh, uh, interdisciplinary conferences of the uh, clinical year. And then there is a return to them in um, the advanced curriculum where students having experienced how these things express themselves during clinical medicine could reflect again on the importance of these topics. So I'm sorry to rush through this. Um, and then I wanted to mention these uh, advanced integrated science courses. The idea was to provide students with the skills they need to evaluate new research advances and incorporate them in clinical decision-making. We wanted them to explore the boundary between the known and the unknown in biomedicine. Um, and we wanted to focus on how they could learn more basic and population sciences, return to the basic and population sciences in the service of patients. So I'll, uh, just a few practicalities. The courses were taught jointly by a basic scientist and a clinician scientist. Um, the richness of this was better, was really ideal for students after their ward, and it allowed for more individualized learning and selecting choices for advanced topics tailored to interest and career path. And again, this concept is developmentally more appropriate. Just to give you a flavor for some of the, con the, the courses, cancer biology, regenerative biomedicine, computationally enabled medicine, immunology, microbiology, global and community health. Um, and the idea is that you can tailor this in any school based on who your faculty are. And if you have faculty who are strong in one area, you got a course. And it's been very, very well received. So just to bring this to a conclusion, we changed our culture from a rigid two plus two curriculum to an integrated developmentally appropriate four year continuum. We went from passive information transfer and large lectures in favor, in favor of highly interactive classroom experiences that focused on problem solving, critical thinking to reinforce concepts. We went from a disjointed, siloed, fragmented teaching culture to one that's highly integrated, coordinated, and collaborative. And from a one size, all, uh, one size fits all curriculum to a tailored more individually inter, uh, to students' interest and career path. And again, I, I, no matter what we do, I. I I really feel that what Holly Humphrey said a decade ago is very important. How we teach and what we teach are less important than the environment we create to facilitate a partnership between faculty and students in scholarly inquiry and, and leadership. The most important issue for medical schools rests in the value of learning, critical thinking, professionalism, inquiry, and scholarship, and the culture of intellectual discourse. And I would add that it's how each school, how at each school we bring together our uniquely talented students and faculty. We bring them to a boil in a special cauldron that results in an delicious, a delicious alchemy, as one as Dan Fetterman used to say, that converts students from advanced college students to um, to medical uh, to physicians. 
So with that, I'll end. I'm sorry if I went over and um, look forward to questions later. Thanks again, Jules. Uh, I will say parenthetically to the group that your paper in the New England Journal of Medicine on rigor in pre-medical education did a lot to inform our own curriculum design. And what you have just talked about um, is a large piece to digest, but we will do it because I find it uh, extremely, extremely fascinating. So let us now move on. Our next speaker, Dr. Rita Sharon, is chair of the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics uh, and professor of medicine at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia University. Dr. Sharon has a medical degree from the Harvard Medical School and a PhD in English from the, from the Columbia University Department of English. Um, and I must say that in two of the four courses that we teach that, uh, that Dr. Curry talked about, um, the scope of medicine and the art and science of medicine, we, we use in teaching the concepts that Dr. Sharon has brought to the world on narrative medicine by using sto medical stories uh, to inform discussion. So for us, Dr. Sharon is truly a, a walking giant all the time. Uh, and, and with that, uh, I uh, ask Dr. Sharon to talk to us about transcending the arts and sciences, divide uh, the art and science divide in medicine towards discovery. And I would also suggest curiosity as well. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you discovering, discovering what it really means to educate a physician, what it really means to be one. Uh, Dr. Curry, I think you and I might have complementary halves of a, a, a way of thinking about humanities and arts and sciences. Um, Cause I'm saying we can abolish the divide between arts and sciences because in fact, both the artists and the scientists are doing what, what Dr. Deanstag just said, um, um, existing on the boundary between the known and the unknown. So uh, between us, I think we can really cover the, uh, the, the many gnawing questions that we all have been talking about this evening in terms of not just what do we teach uh, either college students or medical students about how to be a doctor, uh, but also how do we teach them how to, how to think and how do we teach them how to be ready for the ever new because we know, uh, and, and, and again, thanks to, to those who have come before me on this evening, um, we know that things never stop in, in, in medicine. We're ever able to see things that weren't visible a short time ago. Uh, the saying on the wards is, right, we see this, we see this. Well, we are seeing this in terms of intellectual conceptual work, as well as uh, uh, patient presentation. Um, I wanna think with you in, in my piece of time here about what we're able to see these days. And that's not only with laboratory instruments, including the in silica ones, uh, but also the textual and creative instruments. Um, I'm, I'm gonna invite you to think of medicine with me as a two-sided image. Uh, it's better in French, une image à deux faces, two-sided image, kind of like a coin with, uh, with, with, with sides. And the method I will use, I'm, I'm gonna show you some slides, but later on in this, in this presentation, and my slides don't have any words on them. Um, but I will be bringing to you multiple authoritative voices from, from the sciences and from the arts um, who can speak from different eras and, and, and different disciplines. And they will be kind of my stepping stones on how it is that my groups and I have been thinking about 
uh, not just bringing the humanities in to kind of give the kids a break from biochemistry, but rather how it is that the very modes of thought available to those rigorously trained in literary, historical, philosophical um, uh, disciplines um, enable them to do things in medicine that they otherwise couldn't do. So I'm gonna start us with uh, Auguste Comte. I'm gonna start us with the um, founder, creator, articulator of positivism. Uh, he was a philosopher, he's mid 19th century. He was, he, was, um, he was publishing mostly in the 1840s and 1850s. And um, he, had a, he had a tripartite idea of how human thought arose, that there was the, um, there was the theological stage when everything that was thought had some deistic uh, uh, um, um, causal factor behind it. Uh, this was very primitive thought. Um, it was replaced by, or it was, it was, it evolved into the metaphysical, where uh, the thought was less, was more secular, uh, but also had um, ideas of causation that were quite beyond the human. And, and Kant thought that when we reached what he called the positive stage, that we were then thinking with reason, with logic, not with magical thinking, that we were coming to know through experiment and that we were basing what we thought we knew on demonstrable sensory data, which sounds pretty much like what many of our laboratories do today in today's positivism. Um, but the touching part of his work is that he assumed a knowable natural world and he assumed that it eventually would be fully understood. Do, do you see how comforting that must have been to people in the 1840s to say, not to worry, we eventually will truly understand the whole thing. Of course, we don't have that comfort now. Um, he also assumed, as did his contemporaries, the existence of a reality external to the observer and not dependent on the observer's subjectivity or intuition or introspection. In effect, that the world that I see is the same world that Dr. Dean Stagg sees or that Dr. Uh, uh, um, Chambers sees, that we all look out our windows. I'm looking at the west side of Manhattan. I'm looking at the Jefferson Market Courthouse, uh, which you may hear uh, ringing the hour. Um, and I'm assuming that all my West Village neighbors see the same thing. Well, of course we don't. So, but that was a, a requirement of the kind of knowledge development that was, uh, um, that was, um, that arose at that time. Um, now, positivism remains in force. And many of us in the kind of quantitative and even qualitative work that we do continue to think that, that there is some degree of externality of, of the reality, that there is some degree of sharing of a reality within limits, uh, despite the fact that every observer is observing from his or her own window. Now, in 1865, Claude Bernard, who happens to be a hero of mine, uh, 1865, Introduction to the Study of Experimental Medicine. Uh, he was both a physician and an experimental physiologist. He did, he did very detailed basic science work in the function of the pancreas. He, uh, he demonstrated gluconeogenesis in the liver and his careful parsing of what he was doing goes like this. In the search for truth, feeling always takes the lead. 
it begets the a priori idea or intuition. Reason develops the idea and deduces its logical consequences. Reason in turn must be guided by experiment. Observation shows and experiment teaches. Ta-da. And so uh, Claude Bernard says medicine, unlike what was going on in his era before him, where medical practice was a very anecdotal enterprise, that medical practice required the scientific methods of the laboratory. And he proved that in his, in his work. I skip to 1925. Einstein says to Heisenberg in a conversation, it is the theory which decides what we can observe. Yes? I, I hope all of you have read this. I mean, it's in, it's in many, it's in many encyclopedias of, of the scientific method. It is the theory which decides what we can observe. So what determines our theories? If it's the theory which decides what we observe, what are the theories? Uh, same time, this is 1926, Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher, the eminent philosopher, who, who he, he studied uh, um, 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 authoritatively the works of Descartes, Locke, Hume, and, and um, um, Descartes, I didn't say that, Descartes, Locke, and Hume, um, at the same time that he also was an expert in and exhaustively studied the works of Henri Bergson, Bergson and William James and John Dewey. So this was, this was talk about giant. And he says very carefully, and he has a rather tortured prose, um, very carefully, he's explaining why one's era or epoch, he used the word epoch, and I'm saying it like a Brit, because if I said it like an American, you'd think I was talking about my electronic health record. One's epoch predetermines our thought and that it acts both as a scaffold and a limit. Now, his, he, he put it this way. Fundamental assumptions which adherents of all the variant systems within the epoch unconsciously presuppose, all right, so the assumptions that we presuppose appear so obvious that people do not know what they are assuming because no other way of putting things has ever occurred to them. Okay, so he, Whitehead, brings in the notion of putting things, which means in fact, finding language or image to that says in the preface of the golden, to put something is very exactly and responsibly and interminably to do it. So this whole notion of putting, of, 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 of finding a shape for the thought, is what is consuming Whitehead and subsequently both Jameses. Now, I told you about Einstein in 25, Whitehead in 26, Heisenberg in 27, after having gotten the, the report from Einstein about theories, um, um, gives us his uncertainty principle, which is really the culmination of all of this, isn't it? that indeed, I mean, the, the third tenet, I'll read you the third tenet, um, it is impossible to measure position without disturbing momentum and vice versa, right? So with that stroke, he says, observing a phenomenon changes it. So that the grounds of positivism, even the grounds of Claude Bernard with his careful, uh, um, um, need for observation shows and experiment teaches, it collapses 
if indeed, and Heisenberg evidently was not the only one who realized this, um, that it is realized that, that one must pay attention to the observer and the observing and not just the thing itself. So this was, now this, this is early, this is 26, and it took a long time before their matured, what we now call constructivist uh, um, inquiry, where we pay attention to the observer and the observing as we're trying to understand and still as we're trying to determine or demonstrate causal relationships uh, in phenomena. Um, but but the, 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 the move, the move from a, a, a um, objective naturalist epistemological position shifted or is shifting, it is still in the process of shifting toward a um, collaborative awareness of the subjectivity and the identity of the observer. So that now if you're doing qualitative research, you have to put at the beginning of your article, your own position, your own position, that, that your, um, uh, whatever your position is, uh, your gender, your occupation, your uh, beliefs, um, oftentimes your, your racial uh, identity so that those who are trying to understand what you're saying have some way to place and to comprehend the kinds of um, um, pressures that will be on you as you're observing what you're observing. Now, Whitehead was not the only one to be, to be very, very concerned about, um, about how theory um, decides what we observe. In, how am I doing? In 1942, another philosopher, aesthetic philosopher, Suzanne Langer, sharpens Whitehead's point. She says, our thinking is determined by the nature of our questions and only carried out in the answers. A philosophy is characterized more by the formulation of its problems than by the solution to them. And she's not just talking about philosophy, she's talking, she's talking about thought. Many call her the, a philosopher of mind. So she's thinking about thought, whether it's thought about what insulin does or thought about, about relativity, um, she, is, she is looking very much as Whitehead began to do at the formulation, the putting of the problem. So she's the one who inserts the necessity to look at form. And Whitehead didn't go into the form, but Langer, who was his student, did. Um, form, she suggests, is anterior to assertion or belief or hypothesis. It's how we formulate the questions that will open the book on our potential discoveries. Now, this is radical. And this is, I think, the, the basis for arguing that training in the humanities is essential for the educated person. Because it is the attention to Form, I'll tell you what I mean by form. Um, the same year that, that Langer was, was um, publishing, uh, 1942, American literary scholar Cleanth Brooks is teaching a seminar at University of Michigan. Now, Cleanth Brooks is one of the so-called new critics. I hope I have some English majors in the audience here or among you on the panel. Uh, the new critics were the ones um, in the 40s, 50s, 30s, started in Britain, came to America, who said, if you're, if you're um, interpreting a poem or a novel, all you need is the words on the page. You don't need to know the biography of the poet. You don't need to know the social, cultural milieu of the work. All you need is the words on the page. 
And, and they were kind of reviled for that. And I did my share of reviling um, because it's so counter to what we think of now as, as reading. Um, but, but Cleanth Brooks um, taught his poetry students how to read. And then he publishes it in a, a still magisterial, uh, 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 I'm almost gonna say epic, um, called The Well-Wrought Urn. So he says, we must teach our students, and this may have echoes um, of, of what we're doing in the medical um, realm. He, he, he tells his, his, his teachers, Teach the students to pay exquisite attention to the form of the poem, the diction, the rhythm, the images, the voices, the tone, the ambiguities, the paradoxes. He says, in fact, if we are to speak exactly, the poem itself is the only medium that communicates the particular what that is communicated. Okay, what do we do with all of that today? There are a number of books, one of the recent ones, 2015 by Carolyn Levine is called simply Form. And, and she contemporarily um, says that, she, she says, um, unlike plot, now this is not what she says, but I'm just telling you her, 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 uh, where she's coming from that unlike plot, which is kind of the content of, let's, let's say it's a, a novel, um, form is the abstract force in the background that determines what the content can do. So how the time unfolds in a novel or a poem, how space is inhabited, what metaphors carry meaning, what narrative or telling strategies are adopted to tell the work? What are the rhythms of experiencing the work? What allusions are made to other works outside of the one you're reading? Uh, that's why, um, I don't know if people look at the references, but I included in the references for my talk, a short story called Yente, which is by Olga Tokarczuk, who is a Polish novelist. She won the Nobel a few years ago. And this is a short story in the New Yorker about a turn of the century, um, old, old woman who is being kept alive so that she can take part in a family celebration. Um, and she's so close to dying. And, and the short story will show you that we don't really know when she dies or what happens on the other side. And it is a, it can be, it's, it's, a, it's a goofy, confusing novel because all kinds of magical things happen. Um, but we emerge from this marvelously uh, um, um, uh, configured environment having to wonder to ourselves, well, it can't be that it's just the end, can it? I mean, it's a very spooky, marvelous, and if, and I hope somebody reads it because it, it says exactly what I mean, that it is the form and not just the this happened and then that happened and then that happened that reaches us as readers. Um, so, so what Carol Levine says about this kind of form that I mean is that what we do within the humanities is to develop these very specialized skills as we become close readers, like the poetry uh, group in Michigan. As we become close readers, we we develop the skill of finding order in creative chaos. That we recognize how the structures, the armatures of a text work. How 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 literally how the story works. And that's the only way that you find the illumination to it. And Levine says, these skills are what the world needs now in political, ideological, justice-related work. 
So she argues, and I, uh, I, I accept her argument, that in the same way that I can see the patterns and echoes throughout a long novel or poem or musical composition or visual uh, image, I can recognize patterns anywhere I see them. If I can recognize the patterns in Jane Austen's uh, uh, Emma of systemic racism at Columbia University, or I can recognize the patterns uh, way before the epidemiologists do of COVID deaths in, in the um, uh, uh, poorer communities in Manhattan. Because this is what I've been grown up, this is what I've been brought up to do is to look underneath the content plot superficial aspects of whatever I happen to be looking at toward what it is that is the engine for what I'm seeing. So I, I've been working with some of our um, eminent uh, bioscientists at Columbia and George Hripsack, who's a very uh, influential data scientist. Um, and he says, in a talk he gives, he says, well, we don't really understand how the electronic medical record works. We don't, we, we haven't yet gotten the, the tools we need to understand really the, the, the whole combination of um, events prior to the hospital admission, through the hospital admission, and the doctors are essentially treating the ghost of the patient who came in. He says, what we need to do is, is read, the medical, read the medical record as a metaphor. And I tell him, George, it's okay, we got that one. And indeed, and indeed when we bring literary skills, to examine the medical chart, we see tremendous amounts of metaphorical, metonymic, parables, allegories, fairy tales. Um, it, it is indeed a way to examine the world. So let me close. Um, one more quote. Um, Claude Bernard says, I'm gonna repeat what Claude Bernard said. In the search for truth, feeling always takes the lead. It begets the a priori idea or intuition. Reason develops the idea and deduces its logical consequences. Reason in turn must be guided by experiment. And I put that side by side with a recent quote by Louise Gluck, who is a contemporary poet, recent Nobelist. Uh, the book is called Proofs and Theories, Essays on Poetry. She says, the source of art is experience, the end product, true. And the artist surveying the actual constantly intervenes and manages lies and deletes all in the service of truth. It is relatively easy to say that truth is the aim and the heart of poetry, but harder to say how it is recognized or made. We know it at first as readers by its result, by the sudden rush of wonder and awe and terror. So in effect, she's suggesting that the experiment of art is in its reception. And indeed, um, it is the effect on the receiver that determines the course of the expression, yes? Remember, when we're with a patient, we're the receiver. The patient is the teller, we're the receiver. It's up to us to gather that expression in a way that could, in Louise Gluck's words, lead to awe and wonder, maybe terror too. So um, it's Corvey. Um, 
I'm gonna show you one or two images. I'm not gonna have a lot, I'm not gonna open up to discussion because I wanna leave room for Dr. Perlman. So let me just show you one or two images so that you know what I mean by the um, image de face. So if you come visit me in my department at Columbia, it's on P. Those of you who, who went to Columbia, it's PH, it's Presbyterian Hospital, 15th floor. So we see the marvelous Hudson. And this greets you as you come into my suite. I hope some of you are saying, um, I don't know. I don't know quite what I'm looking at. And uh, if we had time, I'd let you chat some words into the chat, but we can do that at the end. So when I bring when I bring visitors into my suite, uh, we always stop. It's right. It's it's magic. It's 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 big. It's big in this beautiful, eloquent, uh, uh, eloquent, um, elaborate frame. And they say, "Well, it looks like a bird. I don't know. Is it a bird? It looks like a bird with a long beak, and the bird is sitting on uh, a leaf." But then the funny thing is, the bird seems to have the fish a fish tail and not a bird tail. So I'm not sure what I'm looking at. And then maybe the person next to them will say, well, I see a sun in the sky, looks like a fried egg. And then I don't know, but I, I think I see two faces. I kind of see noses. Do you see noses? I kind of see lips. Do you see lips? And the first one will say, Oh, I hope, I hope those of you, can you see them both? Can you see the bird and then you see the lips? And, and I hope you do. Um, you know what? I can see some of you. I can see some of you. Um, Ray Curry, do you see? You see them both? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jules, do you see? Aren't they cool? And, and here's what Wittgenstein said about them. He, he said this about, you, you know this one, the duck rabbit. And he says, it can be seen as a rabbit's head or as a duck's. And, and, then, he, and then he adds, seeing as is not part of perception. And therefore it is like seeing and again, like not seeing. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and this is what I mean. It's seeing and not seeing. And all of the all of the stepping stones have been toward a kind of what is it that happens as we see? Can we be sure of what we're seeing? Might we see the lips and then the bird? Maybe they're both there. Um, perception is not a airtight phenomenon and all of us have to take such ways of seeing into um, account as we ask questions about what causes what biological phenomenon or what causes the you know students of color uh, it, uh, earlier on at my university to have lower grades than the students of not color, for example. So there are so many things to be perceived and my conclusion or my, my offering to you is that we can take advantage of the many, many ways of seeing in order to absorb the whole reality. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, in French, tour de force. Uh, I will uh, paraphrase by saying I can interpret what, uh, you've, what you've said by saying seeing and perception is in the mind of the beholder. And, and that's, a, that's a very uh, pithy point. I will add, by the way, that we had as dean of our undergraduate college of liberal arts and sciences, a post new critic called Stanley Fish. Oh, sure, of course. So, so we, we were indoctrinated. Is there uh, a story in this class? 
Yeah. There are stories galore, which I won't go into. At any rate, it, before we do run out of time, uh, another thing that Dr. Sharon, I think, alluded to uh, is that we are captives of our own environment and experiences. And in that sense, I am fortunate and have been blessed for many, many decades to have in my environment and with my experience, our next speaker, Dr. Robert Perlman. Dr. Perlman uh, and I first met at the first Gordon Conference on Cyclic AMP, where we bo were both speakers. And we, have be we became friends, colleagues, um, and uh, uh, he has enriched my life for many, many years. And one of the really fortunate moments was when we were able to recruit him to the University of Illinois College of Medicine as our head of physiology and biophysics. And I was slightly depressed when we lost him, uh, when he returned to the University of Chicago, from which he had received an MD and a PhD as director of the Joseph Kennedy Center, and then the uh, uh, associate dean for bio and biological sciences. The, for those who don't know, the University of Chicago has a unique structure where the School of Medicine is part of the Department of Biological Science. Yeah. So at any rate, uh, Dr. Perlman is going to follow on the lead of Dr. Curry uh, and my own thought, uh, which says that, uh, in, and, and also what Dr. Deanstag has, has brought to us, essentially in the early 20th century, the mother science to um, medicine was anatomy, and to all of the world of science was consideration of energy. That in, in medicine and uh, begot biochemistry and up to the 1950s, the center of focus on biochemistry in one way or another was energy and metabolic pathways. And then the information explosion occurred and now the mother science to medicine uh, is becoming gen genetics and genomics and I call your attention to a book that we, that all of our students read, uh, a new interpretation called What is Life by Paul Nurse, where he gives a new, uh, comparatively new definition of life, that life obligatorily involves the storage and transmission of information. And with that, Dr. Perlman is going to talk to us about education for precision medicine. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Don, for that nice introduction. Precision medicine, as you may know, is a new model of medical care in which prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of disease are based on genetic, phenotypic, and other characteristics of individual patients or groups of patients. Precision medicine has been around, the idea has been around for a long time, but it really didn't attract public attention until 2015, when President Obama authorized and funded the Precision Medicine Initiative. Here's the mission statement of that initiative, which has since been renamed All of Us. And the mission statement is that this is, that this is going to enable a new era of medicine through which everybody is going to work together to develop individualized treatments. Now that statement is misleading at best. The goal of precision medicine is to optimize the care of individual patients. And only rarely, perhaps for some patients with cancer, will this entail the development of individualized treatments. Precision medicine has not yet lived up to its hype and there's a lot of question about whether it will ever, but if it has any chance to become a meaningful new approach to patient care, it will require the active participation of practicing physicians. And with this in mind, I wanna talk about educating students and physicians to practice and contribute to the advancement of precision medicine. But first, let's begin with a little historical introduction. Since the time of Plato, biologists have had what Ernst Mayer has called essentialist thinking. 
in this view, each species was thought to have an unchanging form or essence. And the variations that were seen among members of a species were dismissed as imperfect material representations of these ideal forms. One of Dar Darwin's many important scientific contributions was to shift this view to what Mayer has called population thinking. Darwin recognized that populations comprise individuals who exhibit extensive variation in virtually all of their attributes. What was important were the variations, not some hypothetical ideal forms. Variation was a key element in the theory of evolution by natural selection. Variations accumulated as a result of a population's evolutionary history. And differences in the ability of variants to survive and reproduce, differences in their evolutionary fitness, led to evolution of the population and ultimately to the formation of new species. Many people have noted the similarity between diseases and species, and there's long been a tension within medicine between what might be thought of as essentialist and population views of disease. In essentialist or ontological thinking, diseases were considered to be entities that had an autonomous existence outside or inside of patients, and that occasionally entered or expanded to produce disease. This view was easy to understand when we thought that people with disease were possessed by demons and that the goal of medicine was to exercise these demons. But although we no longer believe in demons, we still have resonance, resonances of this idea. After all, our word epidemic means upon the people and refers to a disease that enters a community from the outside and sickens its members. In the late 19th century, the spectacular advances in bacteriology, the works of Koch and Pasteur and others, led to the germ theory of disease, which was accompanied by a resurgence of these essentialist views. Diseases were defined by the pathogens that were thought to cause them. For example, tuberculosis was defined by the presence of the tubercle bacillus. Physicians were aware of different manifestations of tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, tuberculous meningitis, TB of the spine, and so on. But understandably, the excitement of the day centered around the isolation of the tubercle bacillus. People didn't ask why some patients got TB meningitis and others got TB of the spine. Rudolf Virchow pointed out that it was poor patients who got sick and died of TB, while well-off patients typically had only a mild illness. But his work did not receive the attention that it deserved. After all, it was Koch and not Virchow who won a Nobel Prize for his studies on tuberculosis. You may think that an essentialist view of disease is some historic relic, but there is just a recurrent tendency, I think, to think about diseases in essentialist terms. And the way we think about genetic diseases today is just the way that our ancestors thought about infectious diseases in the 19th century, except that now the autonomous cause of, causes of disease are internal rather than external. Let me call you to attention to one other uh, important feature of our language. Language, and that has to do with naming. Names are important. And I wanna think for just a minute about the way we sometimes talk about our patients. We tend to call patients by their disease. We say, for example, she's a diabetic or he's a schizophrenic. This language just epitomizes what's wrong with this approach to medicine. She isn't a diabetic. She's a person who has diabetes. And he's a person who suffers from schizophrenia. These diseases are not agents that have taken over their victims' identities. If you get only one take-home message from my talk today, 
I hope it will always be to think about and refer to your patients in terms of their humanity and not in terms of their diagnoses and to be mindful of individual variations in the manifestations and natural histories of disease. The person who introduced evolutionary thinking into medicine and one of my, my heroes, one of my giants is Archibald Garrod, a British physician who practiced in London at the turn of the 20th century. As we'll see, Garrett is the father, if not the patron saint of precision medicine. Garrett had been interested in urinary pigments and in about 1899, he began caring for a child with a disease called alcaptonuria. Alcaptonuria is a rare condition. Its incidence is less than one in 100,000, but it is easily recognized. People with alcaptonuria excrete urine that turns brown and then black on exposure to air. You can see here the difference between urine from a normal person, urine from a patient with alcaptonuria. The disease was originally called black urine disease. Now, it may be surprising that study of such a rare disease uh, led to important insights into medicine, but as you'll see, it, it certainly did in Garrett's hands or in Garrett's mind. First, Garrett was intrigued to learn that the parents of his patient were first cousins. At this time, only a few dozen people in, with alcaptonuria had been reported in the literature. As I say, it's a very rare disease. But Garrett wrote to all of the physicians who cared for these people and discovered from their correspondence that alcaptonuria was much more common in the children of first cousin marriages than in the general population. He didn't understand the reasons for this, but working together with William Bateson, who was a leading advocate for Mendelian genetics in medicine, Garrett soon realized that this observation could be beautifully explained by assuming that alcaptonuria was transmitted as an autosomal, autosomal recessive trait. This was the first demonstration that the transmission of a hereditary disease could be understood in terms of Mendelian genetics. We now recognize hundreds, if not thousands of so-called Mendelian diseases, but they all began with alcaptonuria, with Garrett and alcaptonuria. But Garrett did even more than that. People with alcaptonuria were known to excrete a substance called homogentisic acid, which polymerizes into a melanin-like pigment that is responsible for the dark color of their urine. Garrett knew that homogentisic acid was a metabolite of tyrosine, and he proposed that alcaptonuria resulted from a defect in tyrosine metabolism, specifically the lack of the enzyme that normally broke down homogentisic acid. This slide shows a summary of his ideas. The tyrosine is converted to homogentisic acid in most people. The homogentisic acid is further metabolized to common end products, but this metabolism was blocked in alcaptonuria. The homogentisic acid accumulated, oxidized, polymerized, and led to the black, black pigment. Now, Garrett's proposal was premature in the sense that there was no way at the time to test it. It wasn't until 50 years later that it was possible to study the pathway of tyrosine metabolism in liver obtained from a person with alcaptonuria. And these studies actually confirmed Garrett's conjecture. Garrett generalized his understanding of alcaptonuria as a disease of metabolism and de des designated several other hereditary diseases in addition to alcaptonuria as inborn errors of metabolism, a phrase that we still use today. So as I say, 
Garrett introduced evolutionary thinking into medicine. Darwin could only discuss variations in visible anatomic and behavioral traits, size, coloration, feather patterns, mating behavior, and so on. Physiological chemistry was a nascent discipline when he wrote, and there was little, if any, information about chemical variations among people or among members of a species. Garrett expanded ideas, Darwin's ideas, to include chemical as well as structural variations. Garrett titled one of his early papers, The Incidence of Alcaptonuria, a study in chemical individuality. Here is his first presentation of that idea. He writes, these inborn errors of metabolism are merely extreme examples of variations of chemical behavior, which are probably everywhere present in minor degrees. And that just as no two individuals of a species are absolutely identical in bodily structure, neither are their chemical processes carried out on exactly the same lines. This study of chemical individuality became Garrett's lifelong work. He was particularly interested in the idea that chemical individuality could affect people's susceptibility to disease. In his day, these tendencies to develop diseases were known as diatheses. Today, we would probably just call them risk factors. Now, although Garrett was personally interested in chemical individuality and disease, he was a physician first and foremost, and he emphasized that many factors, including pathogens, trauma, diet, the environment, and so on, are concerned in the causation of disease and in shaping of its clinical shaping of its clinical picture. Garrett stressed that individual diff that different people manifest a disease in different ways. In what I think is just a lovely metaphor, he wrote, individual cases of any particular disease are not exactly alike. They resemble rather the drawings made from the same model by individual members of a drawing class. How can you not love somebody who writes things like that? As others have said less poetically, it's not enough to know what disease a patient has. One must also know what patient has the disease. As I said, Garrett was concerned for what the whole, the whole person, not simply their chemical individuality. And he wrote again, the physician realizes that each patient is an individual and not merely a member of the human race. The task of the practitioner is far more than to apply the knowledge supplied to him from the laboratories. He calls upon his experience to guide him as to how he may best help the particular patient manage his disease with the least possible damage. This passage could be taken as the first clear statement of the goals of precision medicine. The, ideal, the idea of tailoring medical care to the unique characteristics of individual patients derives from Garrett's insights into chemical individuality. The Precision Med Medicine Initiative has done a good job, I think, of studying genetics and genomics. And that, of course, is the way we currently understand chemical individuality. Unfortunately, the program hasn't yet figured out how to study non-genetic factors in disease. I think you understand, if not, I'll tell you, that there is genetic variance in virtually all traits, including susceptibility to disease. And this genetic variation is fascinating and is worth studying for its own sake, but it often has little to do with the realities of disease. Some smart person, I really wish I could remember who, pointed out that if everyone smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, 
we would be convinced that lung cancer was a genetic disease. And we would be studying the alleles that affect the, the susceptibility or resistance to lung cancer. We'd probably even be trying to develop gene therapy to treat people who have genetic susceptibilities to lung cancer. I'm sure you can see how misguided, if not ludicrous, such an approach would be. And this is where we, or you, come in. As physicians, we are privileged to learn intimate details of our patients' lives, their development, their behavior, their family and social environments, their disease histories, and so on. We hear and learn their stories. If we can cultivate the scientific spirit of listening and observing careful, carefully and formulating ideas that we can test or that can be tested by others, we can contribute to precision medicine and to the improvement of medical care. I wanna talk briefly about some of the remarkable advances in medicine that came from the thoughtful, from thoughtful observant physicians advances that would never have come from genomic studies and advances that I think can be thought of as forerunners of the advances that will come from precision medicine. I've chosen three examples, but there are many more. The first is Evarts Graham. Graham was a surgeon at Washington University in St. Louis. A, special, a specialist in thoracic surgery. Sometime in the 1940s, probably just after World War II, he noticed that all of his patients with lung cancer were heavy smokers. Graham had been a heavy smoker himself, but when he recognized this association, he stopped smoking, brought his observations to public attention, and began to collaborate on research that documented the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, and which led to the Surgeon General's warning about the health hazards of smoking. Reduction in smoking, which was a direct result of Graham's clinical observations and research, is one of the most important medical advances of the 20th century. My second example is a team Edward Robitsek and Irving Selikoff. Robitsek and Selikoff were physicians caring for patients with tuberculosis in a hospital on Long Island, again in the late 1940s. At that time, antibiotics were just being introduced into clinical medicine. One of the first antibiotics that was used to treat patients with tuberculosis was isoniazid. Robitsek and Selikoff noted that many of their patients who were treated with isoniazid showed marked elevations in their mood. It was difficult to interpret this observation because patients with tuberculosis have good reason to feel crummy and their may, mood may improve because their disease was getting better. But Robitsek and Selikoff realized that something more dramatic was happening and that the improvements in their patients' moods were above and beyond what would result from treatment of their disease. Isoniazid was known to be a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Their observations on isoniazid and mood led to the development and use of monoamine oxidase inhibitors as antidepressants. And although they're now being replaced by other drugs, MAO inhibitors were mainline antidepressant therapies for decades. My last example is Norman Gregg. Gregg was an Australian ophthalmologist, more specifically a pediatric ophthalmologist. Sometime during World War II, he became in, aware of an increased incidence of congenital cataracts in infants who were being referred to him for surgery. The legend is that one day he overheard a conversation between the mothers of two of his patients in which they were talking about having had German measles or rubella while they were pregnant. There had been an epidemic of rubella among Australian soldiers, which had spread to the civilian population. Garrett hypothesized that maternal rubella 
was the cause of his patient's congenital cataracts. His observations led to studies demonstrating that maternal rubella, especially in the first trimester of pregnancy, caused a host of congenital malformations in their babies. Until this time, rubella was dismissed as a benign disease of children, a disease not worth worrying about. It was referred to as three-day measles. Greg's work and the work of others show that rubella is not a benign disease for women of childbearing age. This stimulated development of a rubella vaccine, which is now included in routine immunization programs and which has virtually eliminated rubella in the United States. Behavior, therapeutic drug use and exposure to pathogens are just three examples of crucially important factors in disease that can be recognized by observant and thoughtful me medical practitioners and can lead to the benefit to benefit for their own patients and more broadly to the benefit of our society. These are just a few of the ways in which physicians can help pre precision medicine live up to its promise. And on that note, I'd just like to leave you with a couple of quotations. The first is from Rudolf Virchow. Even though he was snubbed for a Nobel Prize, Virchow is still remembered as a remarkably wise and thoughtful physician. Among many other things, Virchow said, medical education does not exist to provide students with a way of making a living, but to ensure the health of the community. And finally, a quote from the Jewish tradition, the rabbis said, you are not expected to complete the task of perfecting the world, but you are not free to refrain from embarking on it. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are in or who are graduates of the Medical Scholars Program are off to a good start. Good luck and thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I can't refrain from dealing a bit with medical history in the sense that um, Ray Curry mentioned um, William Osler. William Osler is one of the key, key people in our core curriculum. William Osler was directly followed by Garrod and as Regis Professor of Medicine, uh, at the same time that Everett Graham was dealing with smoking and observing that smoking caused lung cancer, Richard Dahl, another Regis Professor of Medicine, did the epidemiology that effectively uh, was complementary to Everett Graham. And finally, David Weatherall, who actually was a, a friend of mine and who died um, uh, r rather recently. David Weatherall's her hero and giant was also um, Garrod. And, and it was David who made me aware that Garrod was essentially the first medical geneticist. So thank you. And this has really been, in my eyes, a, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, symposium and collection of ideas. I want to, we're, we're gonna run out of, out of time for some people. I wanna quickly put to the group two questions. The most recent um, study by the AAMC and the HHMI before the FRAME study that, that Ray mentioned, but the study that occurred as a function of the 100th anniversary of Flexner categorized medical education in terms of the concept of competencies. And I have a feeling that that concept of competence is the antithesis and perhaps the enemy of, med of medical education, uh, as opposed to striving for competence is different than striving for excellence. The other question I have is, how do we know when we are successful? What are outcome measures that that are real. After all, it is our generation that was educated by the old medicine that begot 
this this era or epoch um, that is the most successful epoch ever in the history of medicine. So even though it wasn't perfect, we must have been doing something right. So with those two questions, I think that that's a lot of food for thought. Um, and I think that will that that will sustain our intellectual caloric intake for the night. I, I, I ask any member of the panel to to respond to those two those two concepts. Jules. Yeah, I, uh, competence uh, is anathema. I think we're looking for excellence. And um, well, I won't say more about that. Uh, in terms of how we determine whether we're making better doctors, I'll just give you um, a little bit of flavor. Every time I ever spoke about medical education, no matter where or when, someone in the audience would always say, how do you know that you're making better doctors? And it's very difficult. One of the problems is that if you focus on pre-medical education or medical education, there's always graduate medical education. And there's the experience of every unique patient that every physician sees. Um, there's so many confounding variables that it's almost impossible to do, a, to do a scientifically valid experiment. So that's why I said what we do is we try to take the best information we can about how adults learn um, about what we know about the, the science of, of learning. We try to apply it the best way we can, um, but ultimately um, what we do doesn't really have that much of an effect. You know, we, we looked at our graduates from our graduates over the last five or six decades we're just as successful as our graduates nowadays. And their education was really, you know, it, it wasn't really that great, but it was the best that their faculty could put together. And I, that's why I said it, there's something, uh, there's a kind of alchemy that happens sometime between the day you walk into medical school and the day you walk out of medical school that converts you from a civilian to a physician. And that can be achieved in a variety of ways but I don't think anybody has a monopoly on what the best approach is. So that, that's, that's, why I, that's why I quoted um, Holly Humphrey. I'm sorry. I, okay, we'll our second that. Dean for Medical Education, Ray Curry. Well, I, I might be able to comment on both of those aspects too. Um, maybe the last piece first and, and trying, although I'm sure I will be nowhere near as articulate, to bring what Rita was saying into that question about how we know um, what we've done. Um, we can't, like Jules says, but I like to think that the way we construct medical education does have an impact on the way people think about medicine. Um, and if we present medicine in the more holistic um, a, a way that we're we've been talking about here tonight. Uh, it, it, I, I mean, even as simple as taking Virchow seriously when he says this is not about making a living; this is about improving health. And I, I would imagine that the way I, I like to think that the way we're teaching medicine now sends people out into the world with a different mission uh, than we might have in the 1930s. So I, I, I'm. And getting back to competencies, I guess I can link that together too. Um, it comes back, I think, to the reality that we can't always measure what's important. Um, and uh, I'm, my major problem with the competencies is that, is when it creates the misconception that once we check off all the competencies, we're, we're done. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not as, bo I, I'm, I'm bothered a little bit, you know, by the language as Jules uh, brings it up, but not tremendously if we think of comp the, the competency, the, the, the use of competencies as more of a credentialing licensing sort of thing, and, and don't confuse it with our educational goals. 
uh, you know, the educational goals are much broader and we, we just have to remember that we're supposed to be doing a whole lot more than making sure that uh, our students have fulfilled the 13 competencies for entering residency uh, and we've done our job. Rita? I want, I want to add a word to this conversation. The word is freedom. And um, the casual way to think about it is all we have to do is not get in the way of what the students are doing. And, and the less restrictive walls with, that we put up against their becoming involved in maybe ways of thinking and learning that we didn't even imagine, uh, the better. Um, that might be a good way to think about training abstract painters, but it, it has to be sharpened when we're training those who are going to have responsibility for others, both biological diseases and social, social existences. So um, I don't like the word competence either. Uh, the only way it makes sense to me is that somehow uh, we, we faculty can have some assurance that at least we've equipped our graduates with the baseline of what's needed not to really, really hurt patients during their internship and residency. Um, but but um, there's no competency um, that will get you on that boundary from the known to the unknown. So I think we, I think we have to just keep talking and thinking and inventing and creating toward a kind of freedom of mind that enables our students to um, learn anew what we maybe don't know. If I can paraphrase Pasteur, I would say, though, that freedom uh, challenges the prepared mind. Mm. And the job of medical education or any education effectively, I would think, is to prepare the mind. Bob Perlman, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to, uh, to Osler and Garrett. Uh, I think it was Barton Childs who said that Osler taught us how to practice medicine and Garrett taught us how to think about medicine. I think we really need both. And uh, I'm... I'm glad to hear that uh, there's a lot of Osler in the Medical Scholars program curriculum. I hope there'll be uh, uh, an equal dose of Garrett in the future. I'd like to go back to one other thing before we call it a, a night. I'd like to go back to Curious George. And it's an interesting thing that ha happened. I had a, an uncle who was a distinguished psychiatrist. And when my son was growing up, when he he was four or five, he was reading Curious George and we went to visit, visit Uncle Irving and Uncle Irving said, uh, David, what are you reading? And David gave him the book Curious George and um, um, Uncle Irving looked at the book, took it from, from, from David and said to me, Don, you must take that book away and never allow him to read anything like that again. That shocked the hell out of me. I said, all of his friends are reading this book. And he said, well, take him away from all of his friends as well. And I said, why? What is your point? And he said, what happens to Curious George? He gets punished for being curious. And that was a, a unique uh, time for me, both as a, as a father and medical educator because it led me to say, what are we doing to encourage curiosity and discovery? And I would submit we're not doing enough. That we, uh, I think though that what Jules Deanstack has told us about the, the further pathway is that that is allowing avenues of discovery by having four group, four students in a group so they can learn and discover together. But that's cost intensive 
and and intellectual intellectually intensive so you're right you have to have a specific environment for this uh anybody else want to say anything before i again thank all of you i have to say i learned a lot tonight it was really it was really a wonderful evening and i wanted to thank all our speakers it was uh it was just fantastic well i want i want to thank all of our speakers I want to thank all of our audience. What we have tried to do in the 25 years of existence of the Medical Scholars Program is to build a learning community. And that learning community, uh, as evidenced by the people out there, now consists of, of alumni, of students, of faculty, of parents. Um, we, when we started to, to uh, at the time of the inception of the program, asked what outcome might we want? Might we want? And um, at a first approximation, um, I suggested, well, we're getting these very talented high school students. Um, why don't we see to what degree we can train leaders in medicine? The next question was, well, how do you identify such things? And that's not easy. But at an at a approximation, we said, OK, if after an appropriate time of training and maturity, your, some cadre of your students become faculty mem members in other medical schools, maybe that's a surrogate for training leaders. I'm happy to say that over the 25 years now, we've trained 1,000 physicians, and about a third of them are going into academic medicine. That's equal to the two uh leader the two leaders uh at least by their own profession uh and that is uh, harvard and hopkins who also claim that about a third of their graduates are going into academic medicine so although as in how do we how do we determine outcomes it's not easy i'm at least happy and, and our entire community is happy with our progress and we're trying to find the ingredients in this evolving environment of maintaining and sustaining that community. And we will be uh, coming back to all of the panelists over, over the four or five symposia to basically help us in this endeavor of discovery and joy. So thank you all and uh, uh, I look forward to further interaction. Take care. And as Ed Murrow used to say, good night and good luck.